Okay, well, welcome everyone. This is the Research Roundtable, Energy, Transportation and Habitat Nexus. My name is Tego Bire, a graduate intern at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and I'm excited to welcome you all today to the second webinar in this year's Research Roundtable series. I, I can't do it in the... We are excited to continue the series with a topic that was suggested in last year's end of year roundtable survey, a focus on management for habitat on right of way. And we've been thinking about this topic and thinking about the range of research that is being done. And we're very excited to have a number of presenters here to provide some insight into some of the habitat management work that they are doing. We look forward to some interesting discussions with all of you today. So our objectives with this roundtable is to one, highlight the current research related to habitat management on right away, facilitate discussion about other current and future research, and then create an opportunity to identify research needs yeah. for conversations that may lead to collaborative work. Our hosts today are Ashley Bennett with the Electric Power Research Institute and Toby Chu with Southern Company. And I'd also like to acknowledge Iris Caldwell and Rebecca Lynn from the University of Chicago team. So just a few housekeeping items, please keep your mics muted and video off except during the breakout session where we encourage you to turn your video on if possible. And if you can, could you please update your Zoom name to include your organization as well. And you can do this by hovering over your name and clicking on the three dots in the top right corner. If you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to reach out to myself or Rebecca via the chat box. And for any questions or comments you might have for our speakers, we will have a Q&A session following the three research presentation. We are recording today's presentation and today's session, and we will share it with you afterwards. Just the restoration and number. We will also send our Mostly. names and email Change. of the webinar attendees so that people may connect. And if yeah, you don't want your name that. included in this list, please let us know. Well, an insight buffer changed. For today's agenda, in the first half, we will hear from three presenters, and this will be followed by Q&A session. For the second half, we will break out into small groups where we will have great questions to continue the conversation and habitat management on right of way. And we will review, review the results of the breakout session in the large group at recap at the end. And now I will pass it on to our co-host Toby Chu to introduce today's speakers. Hi, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have some great speakers today. We're gonna start off with Dr. Caitlin St Stack Whitney. She's part of the Rochester Institute of Technology. We'll then let, um, uh, Dr. Hannah Stout present. She's from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University. And then not last but not least, we're going to have Dr. Lionel Leston from the University of Alberta. So if um, all of y'all can again remember to mute your mics, please. Thank you. We're going to have Dr. Um, Dr. Whitney start. Her presentation is entitled Modified Mowing in Highway right of to Improve Pollinator Habitat. How is it going? Thank you. Well, hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sack Whitney, an environmental studies and science professor and researcher at RIT here in upstate New York. And today I'll be sharing about an experimental research project that's an ongoing collaboration with the New York State Department of Transportation. And of course, please note that everything I'm sharing today is preliminary and represents solely my views. Ooh, ooh, trying to tab too fast. Okay. So first, I just wanted to take a step back and give a little bit of background on where New York is in the context of monarch butterflies, a flagship pollinator species. So here in New York, eastern monarch butterflies are using habitat and plants, including milkweeds and other nectar plants, across the spring and summer months in the eastern flyway. And as many of you are aware of and already implementing, roadsides and other rights of way can represent both unique and ubiquitous opportunities and spaces to create and improve pollinator habitat, including for monarchs. So the rights of way is habitat group that's convening us all today, right, has now led dozens of organizations into the Monarch CCAA, the Candidate Conservation Agreement. Whoops, okay. 
So it's not just about monarchs, though. Pollinators and pollination are very important more broadly, including to New York State specifically. So as research from Cornell University notes, there's an estimated 40, excuse me, 450 bee species in New York State, not counting all the other kinds of pollinators and insect pollinators. And as New York State's pollinator plan notes, New York is a major agricultural state with over 7 million acres in agricultural production, much of which relies on insect pollination. So the figure here is a little bit older, but shows the value of food production all across the state. And roadside right away is cut through through all parts and habitats of New York, including agricultural lands and regions, and are potentially supporting by providing food and shelter resources for insect pollinators. So monarchs are really important and recognized as a critical focal taxa, for example, in the 2015 Federal Pollinator Plan, but there are many other insect pollinators and the pollination service sets can be supported by or impacted by roadside management habitat. Okay, so this figure here is from a 2019 study that's just to in part demonstrate that there's extensive research demonstrating that plant diversity supports insect abundance and diversity. And so this figure is across different kinds of functional groups for arthropods and across grassland and forest habitats. These relationships are well researched and robust. But I can also give you an example from a more applied roadside context. So a few years ago, some of my students and I decided to look at the insects supported by three different seed mixes. So the green dots here represent a specific plant species, a single plant species, and the yellow dots represent a single insect species. And the gray lines between them are a potential interaction that's known from the literature. So the more connections you see, the more diversity is being supported. This is a form of bottom-up regulation in ecology that the presence and abundance of producers, the plants, is supporting the rest of the ecosystem. So on the left, using an older state standards document for a common roadside mix. We found that there were four plant species in that mix, and we researched which kinds of insect species here in central and western New York were being supported by those species. And on the right is an example local pollinator mix that has over 20 plant species, and you can see how many more yellow dots and connections are being supported by that. More robust diversity connections happening there. That's of course not to say that we don't have diverse seed mixes being used, including on roadsides. Many places, including around New York, do have diverse seed mixes and roadsides. So this is an example of a high diversity planted pollinator area. These are pictures I took earlier this fall in a planted wildflower area that's along the New York State Thruway as an example. But one challenge for applying this strong relationship that plant diversity is supporting insect abundance and diversity in a right of way or a roadside context is the constraints that you have as managers. One of which might be that you can't just dig up your whole working landscape, right, and replant it as a pollinator seed mix, even if you're aware of that relationship. There's lots of reasons for that to be true. Cost, staff time, priding, uh, excuse me, competing priorities. So one motivating question for this project was understanding if and how using mowing as a management tool might be able to impact plant communities and then turn how insect pollinators might be impacted by those potential changes. When we think back to monarchs, in here in New York, um, adjusting mowing to support them might mean adjusting the timing to be earlier in the spring or later in the fall, and this is to avoid cutting down milkweed or other floral resources when monarchs are breeding or migrating through. I will point out several studies have recently found that midsummer mowing may actually benefit milkweed and monarch eggling, but that relationship is actually not consistent for other plant species that are likely to support pollinators and roadside. So this is very much an ongoing area of exploration, and there's a lot of context needed to continue understanding this relationship more broadly. So in 2019, we set up a large scale experiment across essentially all of upstate New York to examine the potential impacts of reduced mowing and mowing outside of those important monarch windows here in New York with a giant experiment. We set up 30 paired highway segments. They were, um, excuse me, selected and established through a collaborative process. They had to be at least four miles long, not intended for construction and have at least three meters or more width beyond the safety zone. Then we compiled different environmental data and road attributes about those segments and used a multivariate clustering analysis to identify 10 distinct clusters and selected three from each to ensure there was a wide diversity of roads and landscapes that represented the diversity of New York. At each of those dots that you saw there on the map, there's actually a paired study design. So it's a four mile segment, two of which is in the control and two of which is in the experimental treatment. So the control treatment uses the existing mowing management practices of the New York State Department of Transportation. All interstates and primary highways are mowed a single pass, generally 15 feet twice a year, and secondary highways are mowed a single pass once a year. And the current guidance doesn't specify what time during the growing season to mow. And then once a year, there's an annual mow along all state highway roadsides that's wider, 30 to 35 feet, two to three mower passes, or the tree line. And that timing is also not specified. 
in the experimental modified treatment, this is the experimentally reduced mowing treatment. So the yellow here in this diagram represents the um, safety zone that's not impacted. And this conceptual diagram, we're just showing them here side by side, but that's not true for the majority of our study sites. They're contiguous further down the road. The study design in terms of the modified treatment is both spatial and temporal. So in the previous slide, you may have noticed the modified segment appeared wider. So the study selection uh, mowing treatment that was selected by the DOT is a two-year mowing cycle where every other year the treatment is mowed wider and later after October 1st or a plant killing frost. And so then across all these years, right, and we're about to enter our fifth year of this study, we visit these sites multiple times to assess plants and insects. And each in each segment, we're monitoring at multiple locations to build in replication and really strong replication of these treatments. So we have so many parts of this project, I can really only begin to scratch the surface today. And I'm going to touch upon um, three different ways that we are measuring habitat quality. Um, and there's many more. So I'm happy to answer questions after, but I'm just going to touch on three for today. So the first of which I was excited to share with this group is specifically the pollinator habitat scorecard that's been developed by the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group. And so I'll just point out that there are three different versions of this scorecard, three different tiers. Tier one is more basic and binary, and tier three is more detailed. They are uh, scaled to represent different forms of background knowledge and, for example, plant identification skills. And because we're interested in making sure that our collaborators can continue this after the research experiment is done, we're actually collecting this data across all three tiers here simultaneously. We want to make sure that we have the data at all three levels. And yes, as an entomologist, I need to point out that's a mantid and not a pollinator, but I wanted to show it because it's cute and it points out that rights of white habitats can be beneficial for lots of different forms of life, including other kinds of beneficial insects. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we found so far. We have conducted 1,066 right-of-way habitat pollinator scorecards. So maybe I'll have to hear from the rest of you later in the chat. We might have done the most so far of everybody. So this wasn't available in 2019 when we started, but we've done it from 2020 onward. And so here I'm showing you our tier one results where the greenish blue is the modified reduced mowing treatment. And you can see here qualitatively that more of those observations score yes as to be pollinator habitat. But I want to point out we have found consistent results across tiers using mixed effects linear regression. We found both tier two and tier three scores to be higher in our reduced mowing treatments so far. Another method that we're using to assess habitat quality for pollinators is the Streamline Bee Monitoring Protocol for Assessing Pollinator Habitat. So this is a method developed by the Xerces Society and several universities to assess habitat quality by monitoring native bees and other bees specifically. And so we in part chose this before the pollinator scorecard was available because it works really well for uh, linear and other rights of white habitats because it's a linear transect based protocol. We have conducted 1,300 of these assessments between 2019 and 2022 across all of our sites. So using negative binomial generalized linear regression models, we have not to date found significant differences between our mowing treatments using this as a habitat quality measure. And that's using models that use total bees as a response, native bees specifically, or honeybees. So this graph here is showing you total bee responses, where again, that greenish blue is the modified reduced mowing, and the reddish one is control. But it was true across all of our models we tested for that so far. The other form I wanted to tell you about, which I thought would be of interest to this group in particular, is a way of assessing habitat quality that's passive. So roadsides can be dangerous places to hang out for long periods of time, as many of you know. And in general, we want to both reduce our time out there, but also want to get as much data as possible. And so one tool that we're incorporating is passive acoustic recorders to listen to the roadside habitat when we're not there. These recorders we set up to record 15 seconds of audio every hour on the hour, day and night, and we leave them out all season. So in this photo, you can see one inside of a waterproof box zip tied to a snow fencing post in our right of way. We have recorded 100,000 80,475 observations across three years. This is a total of almost 800 hours of audio recorded to date. And then we use an algorithm to calculate different soundscape scores that are telling us about habitat quality that analyze the content of the audio samples. I'm not going to play any for you today, but I'm going to tell you about three of the different measures we can use to think about soundscape as a measure of habitat quality. 
So the first is acoustic complexity index. And so the acoustic complexity index measures the variability of sound intensity within a recording. And this was designed to really measure bird diversity in particular. And so I will say that from our analyses to date, we have not found that these ACI scores differ significantly with mowing treatment. But I will point out that based on what kinds of insects are vocalizing, um, for example, cicada noise would show up as a low score, which is not necessarily low diversity, but that it actually fills the entire spectrogram. And these graphs here are and the next two slides are showing trend lines, not the raw data points with one standard deviation. The next measure that we're using within this is an acoustic diversity index. And this is calculated by dividing the frequency range into 10 bins of one kilohertz width each and calculating a Shannon index for all of these bins for a recording sample. And so from our analyses to date, we also do not find that these scores differ by mowing treatment when we're looking at them in our models. But I also do wanna point out here that just because it's less diverse doesn't necessarily mean that we're not hearing insects or birds. There are some kinds of sounds that can show up differently on here. So for example, sometimes low ADI scores can be made by nocturnal insects. The last one I want to tell you about for today is NDSI, which is a normalized different soundscape index. So this is actually a ratio of anthropogenic noise to biological acoustic components, sounds that are more likely to be things like truck noise versus things that are more likely to be birds and insects and other forms of life. So a plus one score, the highest sound would be something that contained no anthropogenic noise. So it's a ratio. And I will say also, again, from our analyses to date, we do not find that these scores are significantly associated with mowing treatment. And while overall we may see a very noisy pattern and no signal across the whole season treatment, I do want to point out that we notice the patterns diverging often at the end of the summer season, which is around 220 to 250 in terms of day of year. That's the end of August, the beginning of September. And I want to show you an example of why this might be. So this is one picture of one of our paired sites. I took this photo earlier this year at the beginning of the fall. The difference between paired sites is really most stark at the end of the summer after the control treatment's annual mow. And so this is after four years of our study, right? So the segment here on the right is a uh, reduced mowing and the one on the left is a control. And mowing later is leaving a very different landscape at the end of the season in particular, very different floral resources and habitat for pollinating insects in the right of way then. I do want to point out again that this research is ongoing. We're about to enter our fifth field season ahead. And we think that's really important in part because lots of biological research is one to three years. And it's really important to understand these patterns, both at a really large spatial scale to understand how they might play out across the landscape, but also over time. It can take a long time for plant communities to potentially change and for insect communities to respond. We've also found a lot of local variation highlighting the importance of our paired design. And we continue to incorporate different local attributes like like road size, speed, and traffic volume, and roadside characteristics, including the right-of-way width, slope, what's the, in the surrounding landscape, and to dig deeper into the vegetation community to unpack what's attributable to the change in mowing management versus what's intersecting with the mowing management. So I do want to thank everyone involved. This is an enormous undertaking. I'm one person talking to you, but it takes a very long list of people that enables the safety and success of the mowing treatments and monitoring. And to thank specifically Sarah Lazazero and Mary Ellen Papin in New York State Department of Transportation Region 4 and everyone who helps collect this data. And to thank the people who fund this work to make this possible for us to explore this. And I'm happy to take questions later. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Yes, if you'd like to put questions in the chat, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end uh, when all the speakers have, have spoken. So um, we're going to uh, continue on uh, with Dr. Hannah Stout's presentation. Um, she Again, she's from the Pennsylvania State University. And she's going to talk about the effects of vegetation management on electric transmission line rights of ways, uh, specifically the biodiversity response. So thank you, Dr. Stout. Hello, everyone. Let me get my screen. OK. OK. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, originally, Dr. Mahan was going to be getting this presentation, but uh, she can't make it. So I am covering for her. I've 
and I'm going to talk about the effects of vegetation management on electric transmission line rights of way, biodiversity response. Um, okay, and um, being an entomologist and with uh, the, the amount of time that we have, I'm just going to talk about the studies that we've done in the last few years. Um, on invertebrates, but since in the last 65 years, there have been biodiversity surveys on all types of flora and fauna. Now, I don't need to explain to you all about uh, integrative vegetation management. I'm pretty sure you all are familiar with the, with the, the basic tenets of it. But what I will say is um, that IVM has been used exclusively at State Game Lands 33, our research site, since I've been a part of this project, which is six, seven years. And um, our, our study site is State Game Lands 33, which is in central Pennsylvania. It's very close to the main campus of University Park of Penn State University. And at our site at State Game Lands 33, um, there are five vegetation management methods that are used. We have mow only, we have low volume uh, foliar application of herbicide, high volume foliar, low volume basil, and we also have hand cut only. And so I'm going to talk to you about, um, oh, in a couple of minutes, excuse me. But uh, State, Game Lance, State Game Lance 33, if, if you aren't familiar with it, it this project started in 1953 in response to the public's concern about the use of herbicides on wildlife. Um, specifically, it was hunters worried about uh, deer. So uh, research was started there um, in 1953. And in the early 80s, biodiversity studies were, were added. So we looked at mammals, they looked at um, all different types of fauna. And there were some butterfly studies, but it was when I came on, we really started hardcore looking at invertebrates. Oh, and um, the treatment cycles at Stick Inlets 33 are every five years. So previously we've done studies on wild bees and other inverted pollinators. That was at State Game Lines 33. We have a pre-treatment year and then we have two post-treatment years. And then we've also done studies at two of other, other sites, Green Lane, which is in the Eastern part of Pennsylvania and State Game Lines 103, which is a little more North of us here at Penn State. Um, in 2020, we did ground beetles and other turculus invertebrates. And we did that at two different sites, State Game Lines 33 and at Green Lane. And starting next summer, this coming season, we will be looking at butterflies and day flying moths at all three of our sites. So for our bee studies, uh, we did our bee surveys in three years. And over the course of those three years, we collected 4,991 individuals representing 101 unique taxa. Um, in the first two years, 2016 and 2017, we had three new Pennsylvania state records. So three species that were never recorded in Pennsylvania. And in amongst all of these taxa were rare specialist and vulnerable species. And here we have in the photo, we have some examples of some of those. On the left is Hariotis levity. It was a new state record in 2016. And the middle is a rare oil collecting bee. Um, it's a specialist of yellow loose stripe flowers, which are native. Um, and on the right is Bombus fervidus, which is vulnerable per the IUCN. And also in 2019, at two different plots at Stake Game Lands 33, we collected uh, two specimens of an undescribed nomada species. Nomada is a cuckoo bee um, that is a parasite of um, mining bees. So we have a nice little side project coming up this spring where we're going to go back and we're going to try to collect as many nomada as we can to try to get this species described and named. And here, just a real general, the abundance and the tax of richness. Um, and you see over the course of the three years that we did at State Game Lands 33. And this looks like the, the um, 
herbicide plots have the higher abundance of taxa richness. Now, mo only, our plot, we only surveyed in 2019. And also we are missing May and June data. So this is, that's why this has an asterisk. And also for hand cut only, that is also low. And um, if, you've, if you're familiar with hand cut plots, that you know that they're basically big brambly messes. So collector effort is not the same across um, plots. So that's why this is so much lower. And um, in the future, I want to do a passive only collection at all these plots. So it really just levels the playing field. And that way we can have collector effort be even for, for all the plots. And then we'd have a really a much better understanding of abundance and tax richness and our diversity indices um, for the different plot treatments for bees. Now our ground beetle surveys, we started in 2020. And um, for 2020 and 2021, we collected 204 individuals representing 55 taxa. And here's just some pictures of um, representing the, the really the different uh, appearances of these taxa. We have anything from this beetle that's as big as my thumb to this beetle, which is very tiny. And this is just a, the inside of a pitfall trap at one of our plots. And for abundance and richness, for the same plots that we that we studied at the um, in the bee collections, it almost looks like the opposite, where you have the highest uh, abundance and richness at the hand cut plot. And this really comes down a lot to structure of the plot because it's a hand cut plot, and a lot of the taxa in the hand cut plot were woodland uh, ground beetles, which really like dense woody damp environments. So we're not we're not sure if there's a, a treatment effect. We'd think maybe it's just the structure of the environment, but we are doing further studies to to try to get a, a good idea of what's going on there. Now one of the things that Carolyn really likes to hammer home is this message that productive partnerships come down to people. And um, at Stake Inland 33 and our other two sites, it really, the, the project cooperators and the research team have a very good relationship where we, where we communicate well between each other. And also it's really exciting for us as the researchers because we are allowed to, we're not allowed, but we are free to present our data. We are free to share it with anyone um, and we are, um, they really appreciate the um, data that we send them, even if maybe it's not something they might, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, but really like uh, long-term research permits exploring this biodiversity response because, you know, we have the, 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 the waves of biodiversity over time. And so it's really nice that we have more than 65 years of data to be able to see these trends. And also it's, it's really interesting because you have data from the start when vegetation management methods were so different. So we can look at the years and years of, of data for the biodiversity studies that we have. And here is the URL for our website. Um, I really just skimmed over a lot. So uh, if you go to this website, we have all of our papers, our presentations, we have, um, the treatments, the descriptions, the history of the site, all kinds of information and also contact information there. So if you just Google transmission line ecology and psu.edu, you will be able to get to that website. And that is all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stout. Um, again, if y'all have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them after Dr. Leston's um, discussion. Uh, Dr. Leston from the University of Alberta, and he's gonna talk about how and where to survey and manage right of ways of prairie wildlife and what he knows then and what he knows now. Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm going to, sorry, I'm just, I'm, oh. 
Okay, there. So today I'm going to talk about the PhD research I did at the University of Manitoba in 2007 through 2013. So I focused on rights of way in urban landscapes because urbanization is increasing worldwide and we need to manage more of our urban spaces for wildlife. And I'm not sure why my uh, screen's not. Uh, I'm having problems moving my slides. Okay, I can advance for you, Lionel. Okay. So advance to the first slide, please. There. So we need to manage, we need to try and manage more of our urban landscapes to uh, maintain biodiversity. Um, this could include uh, ecosystems like tall grass prairies and other temperate grasslands, because these tend to be underrepresented in existing protected areas. And as an example from Manitoba, less than 1% of our tall grass prairies that we had two centuries ago are left. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, there. Um, as an example, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, the remaining tall grass prairie fragments tend to be very small, maybe uh, several hectares at most. As an example, in the left hand of this slide, um, the Rotary Park and the Living Prairie Museum. Um, in contrast, there are large, wide right of way sections between uh, road sections that can be hundreds of meters long. And these can be comparable in size or even larger than many of Manitoba's tall grass prairie fragments. Now, depending on where you are in Winnipeg, um, these areas can be frequently mowed and sprayed, which should make them less attractive habitats for many species of wildlife. And we might want to adjust the mowing and spraying regime and maybe reintroduce uh, plant species to create tall grass prairie habitat. On the other hand, the surrounding built up lands might prevent many species of wildlife from reaching or recolonizing urban rights of way that are managed as wildlife habitats. So we're interested in uh, figuring out how and where to manage urban rights of way as tall grass prairie habitats. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And as, as, as a matter of fact, Manitoba Hydro, uh, who is responsible for managing rights of way in Winnipeg, has reintroduced small patches of tall grass prairie to a few of its larger lines. At the same time, Manitoba Hydro is legally obligated to keep it's urban rights of way relatively free of weeds and relatively tidy looking. So we need to balance uh, what we might want as ecological benefits of rights of way with social benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in 2007 through 2009, I collected biodiversity data along uh, 48 right-of-way sections and a small number of tall grass prairie fragments of similar size in the Winnipeg area along an urbanization gradient. So lines outside of Winnipeg, if they're in forested landscapes, they're typically managed using IVM. In agricultural landscapes, the land underneath those lines is either cropped or if it's a uh, or if it's covered in grass, it's usually managed as haylands. Areas that are in the suburbs, maybe particularly near Winnipeg city limits, may be managed very infrequently, uh, maybe mowed once a year with or without spraying. And then uh, urban lines within Winnipeg's perimeter highway are typically mowed at least two times a year, sometimes up to 10 times a year with uh, frequent spraying to keep weeds under control. So I conducted a variety of surveys. I conducted vegetation surveys, several types of arthropod surveys, including butterfly transects, 
sweet nets, pitfall traps, and uh, I mapped bird territories on early morning transects. And uh, I was particularly interested in looking at how uh, the vegetation along lines affect arthropod abundance as a potential indicator of food availability for grassland birds along transmission lines and whether or not grassland birds declined with urbanization due to lower food supplies. Next slide, please. So I published a few different results um, in the, uh, in the uh, citations below each slide. So when I did butterfly surveys, I generally found higher, uh, I generally found higher native plant species richness and cover along less frequently mowed lines, uh, either very infrequently mowed suburban lines, mowed once a year, or unmowed transmission lines. Um, and next slide, please. Oh, yeah, I also tended to find uh, more native butterflies along less frequently mowed lines. I also found that butterfly species richness was generally higher along power lines with more plant species, and the abundance of individual butterfly species was usually better explained by the presence of resource plants uh, rather than the amount of surrounding urban land, which suggests that if we manage rights of way uh, with butterfly resources in mind, many species of butterflies are likely to recolonize those lines. Next slide, please. More recently, I uh, did some analyses of potential pollinator insects within my sweet net and pitfall trap samples. Uh, this, this work is unpublished, but I did find uh, some evidence to suggest that transmission lines with more forb cover, and these tended to be the haid lines in agricultural landscapes, uh, lines with more forb cover generally had more pollinators. Next slide, please. In contrast, when I looked at grassland birds, I didn't find much of an effect of how uh, transmission lines were mowed or on or online vegetation. It was the surrounding land use that was more important, with uh, urban and wooded lands tending to have negative effects on grassland bird abundance. And uh, for one species, Western Meadowlark, the amount of grassland uh, was positively associated with Western Meadowlark abundance and occupancy. Next slide, please. And these graphs just uh, show the relationship for a couple of species, showing that uh, as the amount of urban land or wooded land increased, predicted abundance uh, decreased. And the uh, also, the amount of grassland that was present within 100 meters had a positive effect on abundance. Next slide, please. When I looked at uh, when I looked at uh, arthropod abundance along different transmission lines, um, I generally found uh, that potential arthropod prey availability was usually higher along infrequently mowed transmission lines rather than frequently mowed urban lines or totally unmowed rural transmission lines. Uh, but I didn't find uh, much evidence that uh, grassland bird abundance uh, was higher or lower at uh, tr along transmission lines with more or less food availability. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, along a smaller number of urban lines and rural lines, I did a small management experiment. Because urban lines tend to be frequently mowed and rural lines tend to be unmowed, um, the effects of land use and mowing treatment are potentially confounded. So I want to do a short-term mowing experiment where I left a number of urban lines unmowed for a year and mowed twice uh, a few rural lines that were normally unmowed. And I compared these 
treat urban and rural treatment sites to urban and rural controlled sites. And I did find a small number of uh, strong responses uh, to the change in mowing in a few species of butterflies and plants, including, uh, including a few weeds of management concern like thistles. And uh, next slide, please. So I've published four, uh, I've, I've published uh, four papers from my research so far. Ideally, I would also like to get the research published showing whether or not uh, birds, uh, bird abundance along transmission lines varies with food availability. I didn't find an effect, but uh, I did find some, I know some things now about surveying that I didn't really appreciate during my PhD that might uh, be used to improve uh, future studies looking at birds and arthropod food availability. So first, I used uh, regular humans to do my bird transects during my PhD, but I would consider switching to passive acoustic monitoring, uh, like Caitlin Whitney talked about. Um, in my case, I would have multiple recordings per site over each year, and I would have them both, I would have multiple visits both before and after a change in mowing uh, that normally occurs uh, along urban sites around early to mid-June. And uh, this would allow me to use a kind of model called a hierarchical occupancy model to account for detection probability when estimating effects of land use and mowing and vegetation on bird abundance. Because uh, urban lines uh, would tend to be noisier which could potentially affect uh, what my ability to detect birds. But if I have actual measurements of noise and measured detections of individual birds in my recordings, then I can account for the effect of noise, along with other, uh, other environmental variables that might affect uh, the singing rate and detection rate of birds. Next slide, please. The other issue with uh, me uh, looking at uh, bird arthropod bird and arthropod relationships is that I was uh, measuring arthropods using uh, sweet nets and pitfall traps rather than methods that allow me to uh, measure actual absolute abundances. And secondly, um, I'm measuring arthropod abundances in an area where birds are free to come and go. Now, I don't know if birds would actually regulate populations of arthropod prey significantly in urban landscapes, but because birds are free to prey on arthropods before I actually detect them in surveys, I, that could be uh, reducing my ability to detect an effect of bird abundance on arthropod prey abundance, and hence arthropod prey uh, abundance on bird abundance. So if I were to do my arthropod bird study again, I would probably measure arthropod abundance both outside of and within exclosures that birds can't get into. I'd use the exclosure arthropod surveys to measure the actual effect of uh, mowing and land use on arthropod abundance. And then I would compare with insights, I'd compare the arthropod abundance inside and outside of exclosures to see if birds might be regulating arthropod populations. So next slide, please. And then uh, the experimental uh, habitat manipulation that I did on a small number of lines, I try to increase my power probably by using a smaller uh, experimental area and having multiple experimental areas along each transmission line. So I'd have a control section and a at least one treatment section or maybe multiple treatment types along each transmission line site between roads. And that could allow me to explore effects of the timing of mowing, the effects of plant introductions, such as native prairie restoration within patches, 
or uh, the uh, effects of spot spraying versus broadcast spraying or, uh, or effects of different mowing frequencies. And I could look at an effect of the a mosaic of habitat and management types along each line on biodiversity along power lines. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I just have acknowledgements in the next slide. So uh, my advisory committee, Drs. Galloway, Johnson, Coper, Manso, and Ruffley, uh, the various granting agencies, including particularly Manitoba Hydro Research and Development, but also Manitoba Conservation and NSERC grant and a Science Horizons grant. And then uh, my technicians who were mainly grad students or undergrad students at the University of Manitoba. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Dr. Lustin, thank you so much uh, for that really interesting presentation to all of our speakers. Um, so we are going to have a, a Q&A session for everyone in the audience to ask questions if they would like. I've been noticing some questions have been coming into the chat um, as into the chat. So we're going to try to cover those questions. Um, so I would like to welcome people if they would like to take themselves off mute and they would like to ask their, a question either that you put in the chat or a question that you just have right now, um, please feel free to do that. And I will go back and start looking at some of the questions that I saw in the chat. So does, does anyone want to ask a question of any of our speakers? Please do so. So the very first question, as people are maybe um, deciding whether or not they want to take them off, uh, take themselves off mute, um, Caitlin was for you, and this question was posted by Kathy, and she asked the question: Do you find there are more invasive plants growing in the modified treatment areas? Sure. So great question. Very much of interest to us, and something that we're looking at. So for this specific project. The New York State Department of Transportation identified nine key species of invasive and noxious plants of interest. They were really interested in, in tracking. And our results so far, we have seen for those focal species that we are specifically tracking that are invasive and noxious of concern in the transportation corridor, that we do find they are significantly lower in the reduced mowing sites to date. Thank you. Um, um, yes, could does someone just... want to ask a question? No. Um, Lionel here. I kind of <laughs> want to elaborate uh, on uh, what Caitlin just mentioned. Uh, just by contrast, uh, within the urban right-of-way sections uh, in my study where uh, I halted mowing for a year. There was a significant increase in Canada thistles along urban lines, which would suggest if okay. you did uh, want to reduce mowing, you'd probably want to try to uh, knock out the thistles in the unmowed area first. That was one of the questions I had for you, Lionel, so thank you. <laughs> um, so, Caitlin, uh, for you, a couple people had put in the chat. Um, do you have any publications out yet? I'm thinking probably out yet or places where they could go for more information on the project you talked about. Sure. So I'll, I'll put in the chat in a second. Um, one of the graduate students whose thesis was tied to this project was looking specifically at bumblebees at our sites and their data for their master's thesis was on the first two years of the first mowing treatment cycle. And they had an interesting finding that we thought was worth publishing because in practice they found so few bumblebees that we could not test the mowing treatment. And we recognize that um, a lot of roadside work is on smaller roads. And so this could be an indication that state highways and interstates are a different kind of environments. So we still thought it was important to share. So I can put that paper link in the chat. And then we do have a few of our um, 
previous poster presentations, we just finished this past summer our you know fourth year, which is the end of the second mowing cycle. And so I will point out that in part based on feedback from plant ecologist colleagues, they told us to anticipate not to really see plant community changes until closer to five years. And so the short answer is stay tuned. So I, I appreciate that. I'm glad people are interested and we're excited to start sharing more now that we really have two mowing cycles already collected. Thank you. Um, so I had a question for Hannah, actually. Hannah, I noticed that you uh, showed some pictures of some birds, but didn't um, talk about any avian data. And I was curious if you could maybe just give us like some highlights or some snippets of some of the effects on, on birds, if, if you have that available. I don't have that available, but it, it's, it's definitely all on the website. Okay, okay. No, I didn't mean to ask. Put you no, on the no. spot. We have um, we have herb surveys. We have birds. Um, birds are done every year, either singing surveys. Okay. We also have nesting too. So, yeah, there's a lot of data. A lot of data. Okay. So I'm gonna try to let's see, skip around and be fair. Um, So Lionel, here's a question for you on how do we measure absolute abundance of arthropods? Um, how effective do you think feeding observation studies or reproductive success studies would be to address these limitations? Okay, so um, first, uh, relative versus uh, absolute abundance of uh, arthropods in surveys. Um, it's been a while since I've reviewed the different methods, but uh, sweet nets and pitfall traps would both be considered uh, examples of relative abundance surveys. You can't really use uh, you can't really use uh, those kinds of surveys to estimate uh, actual densities of arthropods. So you would need to have like a fixed area where you're sampling arthropods from. And ideally, you would want to be able to sample as much of that area as thoroughly as possible. Arthropods are free to come and go from the areas that are sampled from the vegetation that is sampled by sweep nets. And pitfall traps, uh, the, whether or not you get arthropods in is partially a function of arthropod activity in the collection period that pitfall traps are open for. Um, absolute uh, abundance would also have to be measured using instantaneous arthropod sampling methods. Sweep nets would be an example of that, but pitfall traps would not because, again, you're collecting, uh, you're allowing arthropods to uh, encounter the traps over a period when the traps are open. So an example of an arthropod abundance survey might be using a small uh, portable vacuum to and using it on an area, a, a known area of vegetation, possibly within an exclosure to exclude birds from predating uh, any of the arthropods inside. As for uh, whether or not uh, feeding observation studies or reproductive success studies would work, um, I did consider uh, trying to monitor bird nests and reproductive success uh, during my study, but I was advised against it by one of the other professors at uh, the University of Manitoba. And while I didn't like it at the time, uh, in retrospect, I, I agree with them. And uh, as for feeding observations, I did try foraging observations because you actually need to, you actually need to determine what what kinds of arthropods birds are actually eating, not simply what arthropods are present at a site. And I found it quite difficult to follow. I found it quite difficult to get enough uh, foraging observation data in the time that I had available. But um, yes, I think that uh, foraging observations and reproductive success studies could be useful if you have the 
time and labor available to do those properly. All right, thank you. And I noticed that we have two people with their hands up. Um, Gil, if you would like to take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask your question, go ahead. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, I just wanted to ask Lionel if uh, Malay Strap uh, set up on the sites uh, constantly and then just having someone going over and exchange the, the, uh, the kill jar and just putting a new one, if that could constitute a proper way of trying to get an absolute uh, number from the arthropods in the, in the sites. Okay, I've heard of a malaise trap, but I don't exactly uh, remember all the details of what a malaise trap actually does. The fact that it has a killing jar makes me think that it would be a similar way of assessing abundance as um, pitfall traps. But malaise traps, would they be used for aerial insects more than terrestrial insects? They're more effective for, yes, for flying insects, but they do capture a lot, though. Mm -hmm. Again, it kind of depends on uh, the uh, types of insects that you think are going to be most important as food for birds. One of the reasons that I went with pitfall traps was that it does sample a variety of insects, including tack well, a variety of arthropod taxa that are important uh, food items for grassland birds. So uh, grasshoppers, crickets, spiders, um, ground beetles, um, some caterpillars and grubs. Uh, with flying insects, maybe? On the other hand, flying insects presumably would be would require some uh, effort for birds to catch. I'm sure that uh, they would uh, eat a fraction of the uh, insects found in Malay's traps. But uh, again, I think it would be considered a form of relative abundance sampling. Also relative in terms of the birds, uh, not uh, the ex uh, exactly the, the the arthropod community because I'm, I'm focusing on the pollinators um, like um, bees and flies so that's the number that I would be interested in. Well I'm thinking that with pollinators you would probably want some other method like pan traps. I haven't actually I haven't uh, done any dedicated pollinator surveys before so uh, that's probably a question that uh, Hannah or Caitlin would be better suited to answer than me. Thank you. Okay, I still I see we we have about ten minutes left, and I know someone, Jordan. I see your hand. I'm gonna um, go to you next, and then Caitlin. We still have a couple questions for you um, in the chat that I want to try to get to. So Jordan, go ahead, ask your question. Hi, um, I have a question for Hannah, just still along the um, bug trap questions. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that you were thinking about trying some passive traps um, to combat that issue with different structures of the different management types. And I was wondering when you switch to passive types, those come with their own biases, like especially with pollinators of the floral availability and how that differs between sites. And I was wondering if you had any ideas about how you would deal with that or um, work with that just in pollinator studies. Oh, Archon resources. <laughs> um, yeah, there's definitely a trade-off. Um, for the for the three years that we did uh, the collections at Game Lands 33, we did all netting. And um, so we we had teams of people with the we had uh, the same amount of net hours, uh, the same effort in that respect but you know how it is you know some people see bumbles and that's all they go after so we um there's that kind of bias so i think with the passive i think that would at least take care of the collector bias i know that that yeah there's um there's other biases there but um i would really just like to see it more even as just as far as effort goes um, so I believe that the, the pan traps themselves would be best for that. 
I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, Caitlin, this is a question for you that was posted in the chat. And the question was, the timing of the B surveys controlled for day 250. In other words, would the data show impacts of control mowing at or after day 250 compared to the treatment? And then they had a, a second part to that question, which was, did you look at adjacent, the effects of adjacent land use? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, great, great, all great points. I really did go fast over not explaining our full statistical model. So the short answer is yes, we have surrounding land use and the immediate land use for all of our sites. And when we run our statistical analyses, we can include um, temperature, sky conditions, and other factors that we know are really important in terms of driving, especially flying insects. So, right, if it's warmer up to a certain point, they're more likely to be out, but also if it's super windy, they're not going to be out. And so we make sure to include that in our statistical analyses, because we really want to make sure that if we're um, thinking about correlation with mowing treatment, that it's not due to multicollinearity with some other environmental or, uh, you know, weather variable. So yes, we're looking at that. I haven't specifically looked at a pre and post 250 date, but because we include our sampling date, in addition to locations, recognizing that we have that, you know, diversity around the state, even in terms of the growing season, we try to account for all of that on the back end, right? So landscape ecology is really messy. And then we just try to account for all of that variability on the back end, basically. Thank you. Um, any follow up to that? Any of the people that I'm reading your questions, you guys, please uh, feel free to follow up after after I after I read your question. Um, so the next question, Caitlin, for you that was also in the chat was about your microphones, the the um, acoustic detectors you had out, and the question was, were you able to check ultrasound? in regards to being able, being able to detect bad activity um, and feeding behavior? Yeah, great question. So uh, the specific recorders that we're using are what's known as audio moths, and I can put the link in the chat too. I assume many people are probably also using this. It's an open source recorder that's fairly low cost. They only started coming out um, several years ago, and now they're much easier to get a hold of. They cost under $100 each, and they're programmable with some open source software. They are capable of recording an ultrasound, um, and you can program them to listen for specific ranges. So many people who are interested in tracking, for example, a specific kind of taxa could program them to just listen to ultrasound. We didn't do that, so we're sort of just listening to frequencies broadly. Um, but it is possible to go back and do that or to subset your analyses to listen for a specific specific vocal range if you are tracking, for example, a particular kind of bird. So because we're interested in using them for habitat quality, we're using really broad measures, right, that are not specific to individual taxa or, for example, like listening to bumblebees. So we're using those indices as a really broad measure, but you can absolutely use those tools to do much more specific things, like, for example, just try to listen to bats. All right. So I see that um, we have a, a really great question that Iris has put in, um, and this is for all of the presenters, and we have about five minutes left, so um, this may be a good one um, for each of you to answer, and then we can maybe move on to our breakouts. So the question is, based on your research, what do you think is one of the more impactful vegetation management practices a row manager could adopt to improve vegetation wildlife species diversity? So, um, Lionel, maybe I'll let you go first, and then Hannah, and then Caitlin. I suspect, but I wasn't able to test for it in my uh, studies, that uh, a mixture of mowed and unmown patches uh, or sections within a right-of-way section between roads might be better for butterfly diversity and arthropod prey for birds simply because some arthropods like grasshoppers they could increase uh, along more frequently mowed lines whereas other arthropods uh, would probably be more abundant in taller denser vegetation or in areas that have more forbs or more plant species uh, butterflies for example, for plant species richness, uh, pollinators for forb cover. 
All right. Yeah. But my uh, uh, my what, study sites didn't allow sorry. me to test that. <laughs> sorry, I did not mean to cut you off. <laughs> no okay. Worries. I Thank think you. Um, I think having a really yeah. big toolbox is is the thing. Um, I know it, it also depends on what taxa you're looking at. I know for for pollinators versus ground beetles, it seems like their needs are opposite. So um, have it like I said, having the big toolbox uh, doing will only really what's necessary. Like um, if you have some problem plants, take care of those, but you don't need to take care of everything that's there. Um, and you know, we like we'd find more pollinators in the, the the very targeted low volume herbicide plots, but we'd find more ground beetles in the hand cut only plots. So I really think that it's it's good to have a mix, like Lionel said, a mix of different types of little habitats is probably best for biodiversity. Thank you, Hannah. Caitlin. How would you tackle that question? Well, I yeah, it's so I think it's so tricky to make a big generalization as Lionel and Hannah are pointing out. Um, I think one of the things they've really learned from this project is how much the local kind of background context matters in part when we're doing these things really at scale. I think one of the things that we've seen very broadly so far is that reducing mowing has increased, and I didn't share this graph, but um, the the amount of forbs in the right of way. And so that's mm -hmm. flowering plants that is going to support pollinators. And so that's true. But as Lionel pointed out, that may not be the specific plants that you want necessarily, right? And so those are the next step of management choices about if you really just want to promote all, you know, floral visitors, then you wouldn't have a more functional approach about just saying it's great to have more flowers. But I think realistically, a lot of managers care about which particular species those are going to be. And so it's, it's a next set of questions about how might this work out or what other kinds of management steps need to be in place to make sure that it's those um, preferred species are going to be supported. Lionel, did you have a follow-up comment? Go ahead. Um, yes, uh, something that I hadn't thought about, uh, but it's kind of related. Uh, it would also, part of that context would uh, be, are there any particular decline threatened species in your area that need a particular kind of management? For example, we're all quite concerned about declining monarch populations. Uh, so maybe we do need to have some uh, right-of-way sections that are pretty much devoted to milkweed production. Although again, you might uh, want different uh, stages of milkweeds uh, for when the caterpillars are eating versus when they're uh, turning into chrys uh, chrysalis or Again, with New York, uh, I guess uh, planting right of, whole right of way sections with lots of lupins to benefit Carner blue butterflies. Sure, absolutely. Which I've never seen okay. before, but I've heard of. All right. Well, I think I think I've made it to everyone's question um, in the chat. And I think now is a good, we're pretty much right on schedule. So I'm going to transition us to kind of the next phase of our webinar, which is going to be an opportunity for us to break out into smaller groups um, and have an opportunity to, to discuss a couple research questions. So the, the breakout sessions are going to be 30 minutes in, in length. They're not going to be recorded. And we have two breakout facilitators for each breakout group. Those are listed here on the screen. So when you get into your breakout room, you'll have two people helping to facilitate your breakout discussion. Um, and those breakout facilitators will give us a recap after we all come back together at the end of the webinar. Either expanding, either expanding those comments or new ideas. Um, yeah, just to add a few other things, a lot of us uh, that were in this particular breakout are very new to to IVM, so we're we're kind of testing the waters as to, as as far as a biodiversity long term plan. We're really kind of testing the waters and and uh, seeing how this is all playing out and how it measures up. The the one interesting caveat to that is uh, two of us that commented are not involved in the CCA. 
we as Hoosier are. So we're trying, you know, we're utilizing the CCAA to kind of drive that long-term management plan. Um, so, but, but uh, it really kind of came down to uh, we're new to this and we're learning. So that's, uh, we mm -hmm. haven't, haven't stepped into that. I thought the one really interesting thing that came out of, um, the research was uh, number one, we, we had a lot of discussions surrounding seed mixes versus soil type and success based upon regional information. And we were very fortunate to have uh, someone in our program uh, or in our breakout group that do does just this. So some great contacts were made and, and, uh, and, and, and I encourage everyone to get Angela's uh, contact, Angela Burdell, for contact information because that's what her she does as as uh, her consulting group does. So the you know in in we just mentioned uh, about scorched earth. You know, starting from a scorched earth template and, and working from there. What's the best way to to find success? But we ended with a, um, a really solid discussion about how to best facilitate. And I think we all kind of came to the same conclusion that the the best way to facilitate the drive for research is really collaborating between the private partnership industries, government entities, um, universities and academia uh, that we all kind of work together to drive the research uh, rather than it coming straight from academia or straight from, from, mm -hmm. from government that we all understand the importance of this and we focus on what are the needs that, that are going to, uh, uh, to, to benefit everybody. I mean, one of those, uh, I use the example of our cost savings associated with uh, implementing IVM. Um, you know, we're driving biodiversity, we're, we're involved in the in the CCA, we're seeing these successes and we're saving money. We're, we're increasing our safety because we don't have the mowing crews in the fields. So there's a lot of positives, but how do you get those positives across um, when, and yeah, and I see a not-for-profit. That's what we are too there, Rebecca. So great question. Um, but you know, how do how do we gather all that information so all these questions are asked at a single time? Yeah, yeah, excellent. That's a really good point, Dave. And also echoing something I heard Hannah say in her presentation is the importance of that public-private um, research collaboration. Um, Absolutely. Great. Okay, Group Three. Anything you would add? Oh, well, thanks, Iris. Um, so yeah. I think. Uh, we heard a lot, you know, same things that Tim described regarding the compliance driven aspects of the work and when opportunities present themselves being opportunistic. Um, so, you know, maybe not really strong organizational uh, plans in place, uh, again, more maybe department driven, individual driven uh, type initiatives, again, when, when the opportunities present themselves. And this was a mix of uh, DOT and, and uh, electric utility in our, kind of in our group, along with um, some government and nonprofit as well. Okay. Um, okay. We did hear, you know, some other things that, that you know, emphasizing partnerships. Um, Brandy from California Department of Fish and Wildlife did, did emphasize that uh, in a comment that she made. Um, that also take, take a long-term outlook. So, you know, even on the compliance side, uh, you, you know, if there's an opportunity, if something is, comes up because it's compliance driven, there may be an opportunity uh, longer term to, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, uh, to kind of take a longer term view to make sure that when something is protected or restored, that the integrity is maintained uh, through ongoing maintenance. Um, and then we kind of ended discussion around the research. Uh, you know, really the, the focus was on uh, maybe sampling methods to reduce Kind of level of effort. Uh, I think a lot of the research can be pretty intensive. Uh, so there was a question on eDNA and there was a question on uh, kind of more passive monitoring, mm -hmm. like acoustical monitoring for uh, birds, for example. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, group four. Yeah, sure. Um, well, like David mentioned, you know, we talked a little about the CCA as sort of a catalyst for uh, biodiversity pollinator planning. Uh, it's been motivating a lot of conversations where maybe there isn't a plan in place. Um, but, you know, as far as other kind of directed efforts in terms of plans, uh, you know, biodiversity considerations for ESG planning reporting has motivated some of that. Uh, City of Phoenix also has a really good example. They have a five-year robust plan with goals and targets for different departments, for monarchs, for pollinators. So that was really great to see. 
Um, on the challenges side, um, you know, addressing concerns about, you know, we're doing reduced mowing or doing IVM, you know, and potential responses for things like invasive species, uh, fire risks, you know, having, being able to address those challenges uh, or those, you know, kind of concerns is a challenge that I think many face. Um, so then looking at future research needs, you know, there was some discussion over, you know, we talk about pollinators and the good things we do, like, where are we trying to get to? You know, what is that? What does success look like uh, for either different species or different parts of the country or different types of operations? You know, how do people know where they're trying to get to? Um, we also talked about the value of aggregated efforts, you know, like um, what we shared earlier with the, you know, different sort of scorecards and methods, um, you know, taking aggregations of that data of things like the CCAA and then, um, you know, essentially being able to use that wider data set or those data sets to like tell the story of the value of, you know, all the work that everybody here does for, for uh, biodiversity. Okay. Yeah, that's an important point. Iris, I'm yeah. going to quickly chime in just for yeah. one last little piece there. And, and and I think Dan touched on the idea that we have goals. Um, I think as a as a group, we can all say that we have an understanding of where it is that we're trying to go, but there's stepping stones that are along the way. And perhaps those stepping stones in terms of like, is this okay as year two response to us starting this IVM program? Mm -hmm. You know, is mm -hmm. is this okay five years in that we are, have we made enough progress? Are we are we losing ground? Are we gaining ground? Are we headed in the right direction because of those mm -hmm. those actions? I think that was a, a, a one, one question that kind of struck me as well. Mm -hmm. They're not always steps forward. Sometimes they're <laughs> side steps, they're back right. steps. Or, yeah, yes. so I, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and, is it, and is that okay? That's the other piece, right? Yeah. Is it yeah. is it okay that we we now have this new problem that we have to to address? Yeah, yeah, great point. Okay, group five, 30 seconds. All right, that's me. I'll do this really quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'd say some of our responses were similar to what others have summarized. Um, for the first part, some certainly do have long-term plans. I'd say maybe something that wasn't emphasized here was that um, our group discussed a little bit the importance of having that long-term plan, but also making sure to be adaptable as things change or of knowledge is learned um, over the years. And then again, touching on some of the same things that Dan just said, um, our group talked a little bit about the importance of research to demonstrate the importance and um, benefits of right-of-way or early successional habitat um, impacts of climate change on vegetation and species, both native, introduced, and invasive. Um, yeah, regional understanding of management and impacts on vegetation and pollinator health. Um, and then another idea I don't think that was mentioned is having sort of a clearinghouse of these um, research topics and research studies and maybe training associated with that. So that was kind of a new um, idea. Yeah, yeah couple of new ideas there with climate change, regional impacts, um, research clearinghouse. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Uh, group six. Hey, hi, Iris. I'll summarize group six quickly. Um, we had we had folks from representing solar pipelines, electric utility, Department of Transportation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and several were really new to this and our, we're all ears in listening and learning, and it's great to see them come out to this um, forum. Um, some were really just beginning plans, doing full uh, history assessment of land use, um, seeking guidance from others, including nonprofits for prairie restoration, and thinking very carefully about how to deal with some of the more dominant native veg, such as um, goldenrod. Um, others have long-term plans and they're considering adapting those plans in the future. Um, and they're reaching out to landowners looking for collaboration in, in some of those changes. And uh, we also talked about open source information documentation so that there can be some more peer-to-peer -peer learning of what folks have tried, what has been successful and what maybe not has been successful. And um, one of the other ideas was pulling lists, for example, of host plants for Lepidoptera, in which okay. case uh, native seed growers could be um, encouraged to grow those plants, and that would really improve biodiversity uh, along rights of way. Okay, great. Great suggestion there, Carolyn. And last but not least, group seven, anything you'd add? Yes, and I will keep it as, as quick as I can. Um, okay. 
if research could incorporate uh, cost analyses that not only include, um, you know, offsetting of uh, the resources required to do integrated vegetation management, but also like personnel time, how they could double up on personnel time in the um, traditional way versus this, this new program. Some other important items that were brought up is that uh, when thinking about biodiversity, uh, a lot of the times we seem to be talking about pollinators, but biodiversity isn't just pollinators, it's all ecosystems. So trying to create, um, you know, habitat and long-term plan managements that aren't only pollinators, but encompass the full spectrum of biodiversity. And, and then that also kind of leads into the, the last bit that I think I'll share is that um, trying to make sure that the time restrictions for all of the different species that are being listed are, are being cared for that's required, but also, you know, voluntary time restrictions um, is, can be a little cumbersome and, and, you know, they're trying to do as much as, as they can to make sure that we're helping, but it can be a little bit too much. So just trying to, to get a handle on all of the, the time commitments and restrictions associated with that. Yeah, and keeping it simple where possible. Yeah, excellent. Lionel, I see your hand up. Um, before I go to you though, I wanna just quickly mention, I know we're at time. We're gonna drop the link to the survey for today's webinar into the chat. Um, so if you can take a, a look at that, that would be great. Um, Lionel, you can add your quick comment and then I have one more announcement before we close. Okay, just uh, quickly elaborating on clearing houses. Uh, there, there are growing uh, data repositories that companies can contribute their wildlife surveys to. Uh, for example, the Wild Tracks uh, repository for ARU data at the University of Alberta. It includes bird surveys that have occurred along or close to transmission lines. So, for anybody that is considering ARU surveys in the future, combining those surveys with other surveys in such a data repository could uh, actually lead to much more powerful analyses of biodiversity along transmission lines in the future. Excellent. And you called that wild tracks. Is that right, Lionel? Yeah, I'll uh, yeah. put the link. Okay, perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Um, as I said, I had just one other announcement I wanted to share. Um, the Monarch CCAA program has been mentioned a couple of times already during the webinar, and it sounds like many of you are familiar with it. Um, for those who aren't, this is a, a program that we administer here in the U.S. Uh, for energy transportation organizations um, specific to Monarch Butterfly and uh, the upcoming listing uh, that we anticipate in the next couple of years. We do have a special focus meeting uh, that will be in person for the first time in several years uh, next March. Uh, so just wanted to share those details. Um, if you're interested in either the CCAA or the upcoming March meeting, again, focus on Monarchs and, and the CCAA um, program particularly, um, let us know. There's a contact information there um, for you to grab. And then um, lastly, as I mentioned, we do have the survey for today. Um, that's in the chat. We'll also email it out afterwards along with the recording. Um, and specifically, we're looking for your input on topics for next year. We'd like to continue this research roundtable webinar series. Um, we do have a couple of ideas for things that we would like to focus um, research presentations on next year. Advanced monitoring technologies. We heard a little bit about some of those today. Uh, really interested in ethnobiology and indigenous vegetation management techniques and what research is being done um, related to that. Um, invasive species management, always a hot topic. Um, and then building on Lionel's presentation, a little bit more insight into what we know about urban rights of way and what the opportunities are for biodiversity, um, vegetation management to promote biodiversity, how that also ties into the social aspects, um, environmental justice, um, those themes as well. So um, when you take the survey, please add in your thoughts. If any of those topics ring particularly true to you, or you either have an idea for a presenter or a topic um, similar or different than those topics. Um, and we look forward to um, continuing this webinar series next year as well.
So I want to thank again um, our speakers, some really great presentations that set us up for some good discussion today. I want to thank all of you for tuning in and particularly sticking around a couple extra minutes here at the end. Um, and uh, look forward to hearing from you and the survey and uh, seeing you next year. Thanks, everyone.